All right, so let me just introduce uh, on YouTube that this is a, a workshop that we have been conducting for the last one and a half months, uh, critical research on intangible cultural heritage. Intangible cultural heritage, uh, sorry. Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm switching that off. Okay, so let's get back to uh, All right. So, um, <laughs> I, I, I just switched that up. I didn't realize that that was going on. Anyway. Uh, we are very, very uh, fortunate to have with us today Professor Sajida Mandal, he, uh, an eminent architect uh, and also uh, one of the trainers. Why is that still on? Yeah. Okay, I switched that off. Sorry. Uh, this technology, we are all getting used to it. Anyway, mm. uh, Professor Sajida Ji, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm sure our students will get very much benefited. We have uh, had sessions with uh, Neil Kamal Chapagain on community inventorying and management of ICH, and also on ICH and uh, gender. And today is the, our fourth session. We would like to speak about the importance of ICH in education. Thank you so much for joining. I, I know that you have been unwell and with COVID and uh, sorry for putting this pressure on you, <laughs> but it's a pleasure. But I would first, as I had said, request you to speak a little about Pakistan and Pakistan's ICH uh, practices, because this is a, a generation which is very yeah. distant for various political reasons from the wonderful cultural heritage of Pakistan. Uh, thank you so much, Lubna. And uh, of course, I must, uh, first of all, uh, you know, kind of say how terribly happy I am to be part of this uh, whole program that you've organized. I have a, a lot of very good memories of uh, Bangladesh. I was there recently as well. And I think when you talk about, uh, you know, when I was preparing for this talk, I thought it would be it would be interesting for people to see some examples of the kind of work that we're doing, which also shows the, uh, you know, the intangible cultural heritage of Pakistan, because, uh, you know, it's such a shared culture that we have, because uh, when you were talking of dance and the young lady there said that, look, I was all, uh, I also learned Kathak. I was reminded of my daughter, who's also a Kathak dancer. She now oh, lives in New York. Yeah. Now, that's a common thread uh, you know, in our entire, uh, in our world. And there's so many things, so many things which we share with each other that it's, uh, in, uh, I mean, we share it in the South Asian region, particularly when you talk of the intangible cultural heritage. And I personally feel that that's, uh, you know, there's a peace building in here because uh, I'm working uh, these days with the UNESCO Asia Pacific office, and we are working on a program that is going to be launched now, you know, uh, hopefully in some, you know, the recent kind of uh, year, in a year or so. And that's focused on intangible cultural heritage for peace. And I've also wow. worked on that. And that uh, comes out of, uh, you know, a better understanding of what the intangible cultural heritage is. So I hope to share that with you. And I've uh, tried to kind of make a presentation which is more, uh, less theoretical, because I think everybody has been had uh, probably enough of uh, theory by now, and you want to see some practical examples of how that is applied. 
Well, uh, just to a little bit about my background, that I'm an architect by training, but uh, I am also, uh, you know, uh, intangible cultural heritage kind of a, um, activist. I have been in the women movement of Pakistan. You know, we had a shared movement at one time, the Women's Action Forum. So there was a lot of uh, those kind of uh, activities, which I think help you to understand, uh, you know, the cultural aspects better. And I see a lot of women out here. And uh, I think uh, the women, uh, and you've already gone through a session on women, on gender and ICH. That was uh, in the beginning, you know, that was a kind of an ignored area. And that, that came much later. Incidentally, I've been part of uh, the program uh, uh, you know, as it was launched by UNESCO, and I became uh, one of their trainers and facilitators for the ICH, and also, uh, you know, helped to formulate some of these ideas in the intangible cultural heritage and education area, because it's all new to us, you know. So it's all experimental, it's all something that we can all do, and we have to keep doing that till we get it the right way. And uh, you know, what's the good part of it, that there is actually no right way because all ways are right ways. If it comes from the heart and the mind, it's a right way. So that's uh, the kind of, uh, you know, a presentation that I'm going to show, uh, show this, uh, uh, this evening or night or whatever. And I need to share the screen. Can I go directly and yes, share that? Yes, yes, yes. I have already. Okay. Okay, that's my uh, that's a presentation that, uh, okay, you know, when we talk of education, there is, uh, have I got it right? Is that uh, fine for everybody? You can see sure. everything? See me Absolutely. and look nice. Okay. So uh, this is uh, uh, based on, uh, like I said, the work that we've done. And in the beginning, there's just a little bit of an idea of who we are, because there are two organizations whose work has been demonstrated, uh, is going to be shown here. And both of them is, are uh, working jointly together. One of the things that I'd like to impress right from the beginning, that uh, you know, we work here in uh, Pakistan, those organizations which are working together, are, uh, you know, very, uh, we feel that if we do not collaborate and cooperate and have alliances, we will not be able to kind of make an impact in the uh, public sector and in the mainstream. It's very much similar to what Lubnaji was describing as the situation out there, the need to kind of form these alliances outside the government because so the government is kind of slow in uh, moving on the intangible cultural heritage. Although, as you know, of course, that uh, this is one of the fastest, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, there were very quick signatories uh, to the convention when it came about. And Pakistan has been part of it right from the beginning. And like the Bangladesh situation, we have also kind of fumbled over it. The governments have fumbled over it, what to do with it. And now slowly it's kind of, uh, you know, there's a, uh, it's gaining some kind of a momentum but not enough, really. So uh, we have uh, uh, the TAP uh, is, a, uh, is an NPO. It's a not-for-profit organization, which was set up in 2006. And it works essentially in the idea of revisiting our history, because we feel that that is important. We have come out of a colonial kind of a period. And uh, in fact, none, our, none of our countries has ever really questioned what we should be like when we shed the yoke of colonialism and then try to do things for our own betterment. So we try to focus on that because I think there's a lot of distorted history which is still around and we need to kind of address that issue. Uh, and that is also critical in the education uh, sort of field because uh, we give uh, very distorted histories out to our uh, children. It's creating a kind of a climate of hate among people instead of uh, you know, being, giving an analytical history, right? And I think a lot of that history was created for us by the British because most of our reference books are from the British period. So that is obviously one of our handicaps. 
Then we are also uh, working in the field of art and culture. And, uh, uh, you know, so that is basically trying to reassess and re renew our kind of a commitment to these fields as being the core areas of uh, our existence. Because some of the sciences, at least in Pakistan, dominate the whole, uh, uh, you know, deliberations. And they also are the biggest shareholders of the budgets in education. So we have to push our way through with the arts and the culture kind of, uh, uh, you know, area. And we are also like uh, Lubnaji's organization, an accredited uh, NGO with uh, UNESCO for the convention 2003. And uh, we are uh, there since 2018, I think. Uh, we've also been instrumental in bringing one of our, uh, of setting the system of, uh, in, of uh, inventoring within the country because it was uh, some project that we were asked to do for UNESCO. And through that, we evolved a consensus document, which is available online. Uh, and it's a kind of a tedious job to do these documents as uh, you know, people will also have experienced. And uh, we have uh, some uh, various types of activities which we do. Uh, one of them is an international conference that we uh, hold on a yearly basis. And we also have a publication wing and we, have been working for a, quite a considerable time heavily in the craft area. The pictures that you see in front of you, I mean, I'd like to point the one at the extreme left of it, because it is the uh, what we are doing in Pakistan. And I think I'm going to mention that because we have this wealth of kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, asset, uh, cultural asset that goes untapped. And this is basically the hakas that are used by the uh, by the craftspeople, and they've never really been collected. We started collecting it some time back. It's a slow kind of a process, but uh, we are kind of collecting it, and uh, we have had a lot of attention internationally on that. So I would certainly like to share, suggest that you could also perhaps look into that area. And the other two pictures that are on the right are basically from the work that we did in the Kalasha Valley. Uh, these are the uh, remote valley in Pakistan, which is basically inhabited by a tribe, uh, by some tribes who are non-Muslims and they live in an area which is surrounded by a lot of, uh, you know, Muslim population. So it's a very hard living for them. It's a remote area. And uh, we were uh, very successful in helping the community in nominating one of the ICH elements for nomination. And it got nominated uh, in 2018. I think that the, uh, uh, you know, it's inscribed now on the list of uh, elements in need of urgent safeguarding. Oops, sorry. Now the other partner that we have, uh, and uh, it's a kind of an interwoven thing because you see, uh, while I'm an architect by training, I also share, I'm a professor of architecture at a university. I've been in that capacity at many, uh, you know, for many years. I've been uh, at the National College of Arts, which is one of our leading institutions. And now uh, we have our own university, which is called the Institute for Culture and Art. So we have an alliance with TAP and the institution because we have very similar ways of addressing, uh, you know, um, culture and uh, also a pedagogy, which we kind of agree with. And we are working with and trying to develop those kind of pedagogies. So that is our, uh, you'll see a lot of that, uh, uh, you know, uh, parallel of uh, these two organizations in the work that I'm going to show you. And uh, what we have at the university now, it's a very f new university. In fact, it's the newest university in Pakistan. It got its started in 2018. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, 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 so we had basically in the setting up of this university, really re-questioned the whole idea of a university in education uh, in a country which had, which was now, you know, uh, out of a colonial situation, because so far we had just been repeating things that were happening in the West and borrowing curriculum and things like that. So we decided to revisit. Now, one of the things that we did was really question uh, the whole issue of language. And you would obviously know in Bangladesh how important that question was, uh, you know, uh, because uh, I think Bangladeshis, all, all the people of Pakistan suffered on that. So it's a very important question and we very boldly attacked that and we've said we will make that 
as mandatory the mother language and uh, we have uh, opened up uh, um, uh, you know a maboli center the mother language center where many languages are kind of handled according to what the students uh, body is like uh, so uh, we are also looking at uh, the traditional practices versus the contemporary and recognizing the two streams of uh, knowledge which exist one of our fundamental problems in education is the fact that we only recognize the contemporary stream and the in uh, the intangible stream uh, you know is rooted within the traditional stream so once you ignore that you actually ignore a huge part of the knowledge that exists within uh, you know our countries and within our communities and people and we have many many collaborations and the reason i stress on this collaboration is because uh, you know um, i think we are open to the idea of collaborating and we all should be because it's something which will give us the united strength because we already have so many things pitched against us particularly the sciences and all that so you sometimes feel that those alliances help you through uh, we have four schools at the moment it is art architecture and urbanism and then we have uh, <clears throat> films and animation and gaming and then we have a special department which is on culture and language uh, incidentally that's the first department that is within the country on this uh, subject because we don't have any other universe uh, you know any other university which is offering these kind of disciplines and also no university in pakistan addresses the issue of uh, of the mother language so we have a lot of first that we've done and these are just some images of the university we were one and a half year old now these two uh, organizations when they come together we have managed to kind of pull our strengths because we have a publication cell at the uh, at tap we have many books that we've published you can see it on our website and we also have the tap crafts that we have been working with and tap crafts is incidentally a standard setting kind of a uh, grow, you know a cell to try and keep the standards in as uh, you know at a high quality within the craft sector that's basically the aim and it's a, a, a registered company with the uh, you know with the security exchange commission of pakistan and then we have of course our partnership with tap now you know uh, i think the first we need to kind of raise a few questions out here and kind of try to understand <laughs> uh, put on the table a few of the basic things now what we saying in, in uh, the topic that lubna ji wanted me to talk about was intangible cultural heritage in education the question we want to raise out here is this can education play a key role in safeguarding the intangible cultural heritage and you know and uh, we are you know obviously also whether uh, you know the uh, intangible cultural heritage is a role to play within education and is that role significant or not so one uh, what we uh, you've been talking about i think uh, when you looked into the convention that one of the things that we stress upon in the convention is the fact that to safeguard intangible cultural heritage the primary thing is to have the intergenerational transmission of cultural knowledge from one generation to another we were given that you know we were inherit we inherited that from our elders and it is now our responsibility to make sure that we are able to pass it on at this point let me also say because that is a bit of a problem that occurs at least within our uh, within pakistan that this is not a static thing it's a dynamic thing so there's a capacity for it to change and evolve as you work with within the area of intangible cultural heritage then the best thing that happens and that is a significant contribution that intangible cultural heritage makes that you talk about a context specific knowledge and what we are saying that the local content that you can introduce within a curriculum within the subjects uh, you know which are uh, okay which are content driven they give that richness to education and also they make it more understandable and more uh, you know is uh, the students are in a very better position to grasp the whole thing better you know if they are able to kind of understand the context and there's a drive towards that 
at least in Pakistan, it's sporadic. Sometimes, you know, the government agrees to it and sometimes they don't. But uh, this, I think all educators do understand that. It is, it is as saying that, you know, sort of the mother language, when you educate people in the mother language, you say that they understand through that language all the information that you are communicating to them. Likewise, if you give them a reference, which is something that they're familiar with, they will understand better. That is a, a given, you know, that's a proven point now. Then uh, we have uh, that uh, one of the tragedies of our education, I call it a tragedy because I've seen how it can uh, really kind of, uh, you know, kind of alienate a group of people from their community. And to give you an example, that there is a very excellent organization that we have in Balochistan, which works at, uh, with communities in education. And that lady out there, Purudulan, she always tells me, gives me this example, that, you know, when you send the child to the school, they will go, they will first put them in a uniform. They will make them, uh, you know, dress differently. They will make them uh, talk in a different language. And that is a process of alienation that happens with the communities. So I think that uh, when you are bringing intangible cultural heritage, uh, you know, closer into the educational system, and uh, you are bringing that appreciation and that acknowledgement of it, you are obviously reducing that sense of alienation. And you can, uh, you know, uh, I think in our kind of societies to have a, uh, you know, a harmonious society, you need that kind of a, a reduction in alienation. And then the, another point that uh, I wanted to bring up was that uh, the intangible cultural heritage, uh, it uh, is a very, very good tool towards, uh, you know, so people, uh, you know, your students, uh, under, uh, you know, appreciating the cultural diversity. It is very essential to have that kind of a knowledge there because it cannot be that, you know, I have, what I say is the only way, you know, or what I'm, what I do is the is the way, you know, that is the kind of a problem that occurs in uh, in many societies and particularly where, you know, the democracies haven't really taken root and where people's voice is very weak. So this kind of, a, you know, problem start. So that appreciation of cultural diversity is something that is communicated through an understanding of the intangible cultural heritage. Then a global citizenship, if you obviously appreciate each other, it leads to that kind of uh, understanding. And then of course it contributes towards a sustainable development. And as we go later on in the example, some of that will come across in the kind of work that we have been doing. And of course, increasing uh, educational relevance, because often you find that people who are educated, uh, you know, in our school systems, uh, they are kind of, uh, they don't really know what to do with themselves because they are not, there's no focus on educating people according to the need of our society. I mean, so, some of our universities are famous for just producing people to, to you know, students to graduate and go straight off to serve in uh, the West somewhere. So if you really want to be, you know, anchored within your own societies, then of course, intangible cultural heritage is also a contributor to that kind of uh, anchorage. And uh, peace, peace and harmony and all that, I've already uh, mentioned that. And just a reference, because we sh must always remember that there is the intangible cultural heritage, uh, uh, you know, convention, which is a good tool, you know, and it is evolving. Of course, there are serious issues, uh, you know, sometimes you think that, oh, this should have been done better, but I've also seen the evolution of it. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, the gender was not really mentioned earlier, but now it is. And now we're talking of peace through intangible cultural heritage. So uh, let's formulate some of the further questions. Because sometimes when you talk of education and you are, uh, you know, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is the education of young children in schools. So we want to see whether that is the only education that we uh, as workers of the intangible cultural heritage can offer, or are there other ways also that uh, we should explore? Uh, the, uh, so we could see, we could say that the question is, okay, what knowledge is embedded in ICH and how can that be unlocked? That's the first thing. 
how do we view the intangible cultural heritage and what do you find within it that is important to introduce within us uh, within the learning and education aspect of it i'm not talking of skill because what has also happened is that you have uh, you know reduce the intangible cultural heritage to a skill people have lost also the sense of what it meant and what are the underlying kind of a knowledge that is available the layers of knowledge which are available so then our second question is this key whose education who can this be useful for right so we say okay school children because we opened up with that and everybody mentioned that so this is one of the obvious things then we know higher education higher education in fact is not taken cognizance of uh, intangible cultural heritage as they can and as they should uh, but uh, you know they kind of do it in compartments that you could have uh, you know a we teach architecture for example but it's not really intangible cultural heritage because it's not mandatory for architecture schools to look at the intangible as, uh, heritage of it and the traditions and the indigenous uh, kind of systems of building and all that then the other in, uh, part of that is the informal education the education which takes place at the community level is that some place where intangible cultural heritage and its understanding can be invested for the betterment of communities then we also have other places uh, where the contemporary uh, world has offered us for example museums we look at museums as uh, they're mainly kind of places where you you go as spectators and you look at objects which are on display but is there a dynamic role that museums can play and integrate it to the education and then we have the traditional systems of education and the informal settings where that those are uh, you know sort of imparted for example we have out here two examples i'll give you we have something which is called the hujra which is the man's long house let me say and that was where the knowledge of the intangible culture was transmitted to the youth but that whole system has collapsed and there's no replacement for it so is there kind of a, a way to look at that uh, issue that has occurred similarly there was gudar i mean many years ago i think it's about 20 years back i went to the cape uh, to one of our provinces and i was given a task of looking at how you know one of the uh, uh, you know donor agencies could uh, do a, a culture program there the moment i met the women and they are all you know uh, very much in parda and it's a very conservative kind of a province in pakistan next to the afghanistan border and the women out there said oh you've come again you are now now what are you going to get uh, get rid uh, you know get uh, uh, you know take away from our lives so i said look what happened and they said well we didn't have tapped water in our houses but uh, we were uh, going down to the stream and all of us went there to the gudar they call it the gudar and that gave us the opportunity to interact and also it became the place where they would transmit the cultural knowledge from a generation to generation and in fact that was the area where they produced the most fantastic type of poetry which exists in pakistan it is completely something out of this world it's called a tappa it's a 22 syllable uh, kind of a poetic uh, form and you know it's not really known probably very well outside pakistan but it's a beautiful kind of a thing and then we are looking also new opportunities and new venues you have all these great entertainment spaces and they're all kind of many of them are very crazy kind of places but we also want to see is there an intangible aspect to it which we could highlight and it becomes educative in nature so we have our young people in our communities who are able to benefit from those i'll give you one or two examples of what we mean by the uh, you know by the uh, i i wonder whether i can turn this around in direction okay okay i'll okay fine you'll have to bear with me on this one okay the other uh, th- this uh, can you see the image well enough yes yes very well okay now this image i uh, we were working in the cholistan desert and we were looking at the tangible and the intangible cultural heritage and we came across this fantastic fantastic things that people know how to do there 
And one of them is this traditional house that they make. Yeah, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, the, uh, the, there are, you know, like this formation of houses that uh, look like a random kind of a group of, uh, uh, you know, houses. Now, the tradition out there is just that when the, the monsoon season is there, the people go back into this desert because it's very arid. And uh, when the monsoons are over, people tend to kind of start going out. These are nomadic tribes. So they leave these, uh, uh, these little gopas, they are called, just closed and locked out there. You know, they're just closed with their belongings in it. It's a very lowly populated area and there are tribes there, so it's pretty secure. And what is really fantastic is that they do not move from their place. They do not move an inch. If you've ever walked in a desert, you realize how difficult it is to keep something anchored. So they know the art of anchoring this kind of a heart of theirs in the middle of a desert, leaving it alone and um, returning to it next year and opening it up and going in, right? So I, fi I find it as a fascinating example of the kind of information that you can derive or you can get the knowledge you can get out of this, right? So this is uh, one example that I would like to share. The other example that I'm giving you is again from the, uh, this uh, place in, the, uh, in Cholistan. And this again uh, draws you into, for those of you who are uh, you know, into folklore, you'll find this interesting because uh, what you see in front of, it, uh, front of us are these images. This is a wedding kind of a uh, rally, the, uh, you know, a wedding kind of a shawl for the couple. And uh, there are bird forms and there are flower forms and all that. These are all stylized forms of, uh, of plants that exist there. Then within that, you can put up a whole lecture or a whole class of uh, geometry. So unlocking the potential is basically looking at the layers of information that you can derive out of it. We also came across uh, the oral and poetic traditions, the folklore. And those uh, in folklore would find it interesting that we uh, have a, rec uh, a rec uh, we recorded a song because we were recording the songs and dances and you know the other uh, you know uh, folklore kind of uh, uh, elements, and we came across a song which was on the Hakra River. The Hakra River was the one which irrigated the Cholistan Desert, and it dried three thousand five hundred years ago. And in this song, they were invoking animals which were not existing, uh, existing anymore in the desert. They talked of plants, and they were basically invoking the desert before it dried up. And then as a good kind of uh, intangible cultural heritage element uh, uh, you know, uh, demonstrates, they were adding on to it. So in the end, they kind of said, okay, they invoked the local peer and they said, will you make this river flourish again? Right. So this is a wealth of information that you have out here, better than any other jo any geography book or anything that you will get. So this from one song, you could be embedding it within the geography lessons and all that. Then there is also obviously a lot of you are from the music uh, kind of a background and you know the mathematical uh, you know, side of uh, music. You know, we, ne we never speak about that. We never talk about that because we have uh, tended to make it, uh, uh, you know, like a kind of a, uh, we don't, uh, we haven't tried to kind of make it contextual or humanize it to make it understandable. So this is the kind of thing that comes uh, from the knowledge of intangible cultural heritage. The one at the bottom uh, left out here, you know, shows a piece of pottery which belonged to the Hakra civilization. You know, this is an old uh, you know, antique uh, archaeological piece. And next to it is a tie and dye, uh, you know, uh, uh, shawl, which is recent. So there is this tradition of continuity, which you can also see there. And there's a geometric kind of uh, patterns which are coming, coming out of it. And then there's so much there which shows you little stylized animal forms and all that. And you see that uh, those are still being used. So it's an intangible cultural heritage. It's associated with an archaeological site. 
and uh, you can unlock it. You can uh, use it uh, to gain the knowledge from it. Then uh, my third example out here from the desert again is the is the uh, way of uh, you know managing water because it's a desert and they have found the rainwater harvesting techniques out here. I'm showing these uh, uh, pictures because this was an intervention by the government when they went there and they took it over and they tried to kind of organize it in the way that the tribes would do. But they didn't bother to really ask them because a project would have first obviously found out, you know, how people do it themselves, right? But they didn't bother on that. So they ended up in a big problem and, uh, you know, there were lots of uh, you know, issues there. But uh, 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 the other thing I want to po uh, point out that we see trees and many of us don't even uh, realize the medicinal value of that tree or what uh, the whole qualities of those trees are. So these uh, people in that intangible cultural heritage, they have that, that kind of a knowledge embedded out there. You know? And they are using these trees. There are the names out here in the, in the uh, slide which are the, uh, to, for the purification of water. Another example I can give you, which comes from the intangible culture, cultural heritage, is this uh, Muranga tree, which has now become very famous. These trees are from the South Punjab. They are in Bangladesh. They are probably in, they must be in India, you know, in all our region. And we are the ones whose knowledge existed in our communities, but we never really tapped it. Because these people in the desert, they know how to purify, chemically purify water using the seeds of that tree. And now you have that named as the miracle tree and sachets coming to us from all over uh, for people who are now doing that research. But these are the, the rightful owners of that, you know, the people sitting in the desert. So this is a little toba, we could, they call it the toba, the rainwater harvesting. So our case studies now, and the first case study that we have is of uh, ICH and education. And we are talk going to be talking about integrating ICH in education and learning. And we say, okay, okay why integrate a heritage edu education in schools? That repeated question, because that will always be there with you. Uh, because, you know, you are obviously in a very, uh, you know, in a conventional system of education where uh, the interventions that are made are usually coming from, to us from outside, from the West, who are developing, de developing those systems much more, the pedagogies and all that. And now is our opportunity to, to develop those pedagogies. So we have to all the time, you know, this question will come in your mind for anybody who's working out here, because you have a bit of a, you're a little nervous, okay, is it going to work or not work? So we are, this group of uh, people who are walking, uh, you know, going around in the schools, and we say, okay, okay, okay we tell people that there, there are these layers of uh, knowledge, wisdom, and meaning that these intangible cultural heritage elements have. So we had a technique of how to do that, which I'll come to later. But our initial argument, we, uh, you know, based it on calligraphy, because calligraphy is a very popular kind of, a, uh, you know, um, art form in Pakistan. And basically, the connection to the Holy Quran is kind of like valued a lot. So we use that as an example, because a lot of people don't realize that when call calligraphy is made, there's a very geometric kind of a way that it's done, and there's a whole proportioning system that has evolved for it. So we uh, made our ustads unlock that in front of the teachers and everybody for them to understand how this could then be integrated in or fused into your class of uh, geometry or whatever. So the, uh, the second point we are saying is this, that the integration of this knowledge, wisdom, and technical know-how, as well as the value, meaning, and symbolism embedded within these elements into the, into the formal education and learning, ensure that this all, uh, knowledge will not be lost, but will pass on to the next generation. Just to give you an example, that one of the reasons that you find craft products very boring because there's, there's repetition out there and there's no idea of what it means because people have lost that sense of meaning or what it really meant to the earlier generation. So they're unable to build on it. And now with uh, this whole uh, convention which has come in, people are revisiting that and they're looking at it. Okay, what did it really mean? And you will uh, you know, also have to obviously do that to be able to build the resources which can then be integrated within uh, you know, the school systems. 
So this is again, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't think that I need to repeat that. But uh, the last one is this respect the tradition bearers and the community, because that is again something that people have lost in our part of the world. We, I'm not talking of the few people who are working in the sector of culture. I'm talking of the general public. They think that these people are old fashioned and they don't know anything. And they've discarded that knowledge. So we have, uh, you know, if you want to work with ICH in education, you have to recapture that. And you have to say that this is a stream of uh, knowledge, which we need to now understand better. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, one of the, uh, the middle point that uh, you see in, on the screen is the fact that you do not just speak of contemporary knowledge because there is the contempt, uh, you do not just speak of traditional knowledge. You are trying to put the traditional and the contemporary knowledge together. You know, you cannot discard one for the other and you have to give space to both and you have to find ways to handle it. And I have an example to show you that. And, uh, you know, the first point I've raised several times, the picture out there that you see is a resource kit that we made for the teachers and uh, these are the figures that we gave out there representing men and women and, you know, just a little fun kind of a thing. Uh, so the first project that we did with the UNESCO Asia Pacific uh, office, uh, where Tim Curtis used to be there at that time, and that was the first exploration that happened to see how could we do that. And that was uh, focused on developing the methodologies and the pedagogy and really looking at it, will it work or not? So we were working in Pakistan and we had 11 schools that we worked with. And uh, so we thought of, uh, and we would, uh, so we uh, kind of had these, uh, you know, you obviously know about the domains because other speakers have spoken about that. So we selected within the domains that, uh, you know, uh, which ones would suit us, right? Which one can we work with? It's not what would suit us as people, but it's basically, uh, oh God. it's, it's, uh, so it's basically this, that uh, we work with the communities to identify the ICH and what is the value to the people. So it's not something that you can sit in uh, in Dhaka and do and you know say okay in some remote corner this is what is happening. It's not your kind of an ICH. It is the ICH of the communities. So unless there's an involvement of that, it's a meaningless kind of an exercise. So we can't, couldn't sit in Lahore and do anything, and we were asked to go into the Fata region to work. And at a time when you know the Fata region, which is the tribally, tribal areas of Pakistan, were not a very safe area because they're right next to Afghanistan. But we managed somehow or the other to kind of find ways to reach the community. So we have to uh, be working with communities to talk to them about what they think is the ICAs that they value. And, what, uh, uh, and then we kind of discuss it and talk about it and speak to the, uh, the masters, uh, the ustas as we all call them in our part of the world. And we try to understand what, uh, you know, how they do it. Usually it is through demonstrations. And we also always include teachers with us and curriculum developers and all that. So it's really a group of people who are sitting there and trying to understand what it is. And then slowly through that, we build up, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, what are the domains that are uh, something that we could introduce? What is the methodology of introducing? Now, this is all available in a book, uh, in a book which is online, and it is called the, uh, from Pakistan, it's called the, the National Guidelines uh, for Integrating Culture in the uh, ICH in the Schools. And uh, for, uh, from the Bangkok office, they had one guideline for the Asia-Pacific region based on the work done by four countries, Pakistan, Palau, Vietnam, and uh, Uzbekistan. These were the four countries in this pilot. So, so this kind of a working, we came up uh, with some ideas on, on how to do it. So, uh, sorry. So, uh, now just to illustrate what happened at the end of it, because as we went into the classroom and we started 
uh, you know, uh, taking it to the children and our teachers were with us and they are the ones who developed the lesson plans. In fact, uh, you know, we were successful in doing lesson plans. Frankly, we didn't know one thing from the other. I'm, a I'm not a secondary school teacher. You know, we are tertiary school, you know, we are university teachers. So we didn't know how to go about it. And we did the one good thing that we invited to all the school teachers and we had a group of them working with us. So they started developing lesson plans, something that they normally do. Now, we didn't realize that, you know, coming in through that kind of a door was the most difficult one because they always do that through special clubs there and, you know, like uh, curriculum uh, changes and all that. Now, this was a very gentle fusion of cultural knowledge within the classroom subjects that they are teaching. So it's a subject uh, fusion. And uh, the physics class teacher was amazing. He was a Malvi and a man at Duboot. And what he was doing was this, that he uh, had a sub, uh, you know, the lesson that he had to do of sound. You know how sound is created and all that. And he used the musical instruments and he made them first play the musical, uh, you know, um, different is instruments. And then he would explain to his class and all that. And one of the things that he was very proudly telling us that for the first time, he knew that in his class, there were excellent players of rabab, which is a musical instrument from uh, the KP area. So this was a uh, thing which became pretty popular. And I think this whole lessons are also available online uh, on some of our websites and uh, you know, UNESCO has also put it. Then the other nice kind of a thing we came across were the geography lessons that they embedded within uh, you know, the uh, traditional stories. Now, KP area, the, you know, this province of, uh, which was earlier called the NWFP. So this is now called Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So the KP area is famous for its stories. And when you start listening to the stories, you realize that this is, uh, you know, safeguarding the, the knowledge of history and geography. So they put that story into the class and they unfolded and deconstructed it to talk about the uh, hidden knowledge and uh, of uh, history and of uh, geography in it. It became quite exciting and it was something that the children loved. Of course, we also, uh, uh, you know, in this whole endeavor, there was one side which was to connect the tradition bearers and the knowledge bearers to the schools. So these knowledge bearers raised, uh, ranged from grandmothers who were kind of like uh, storytellers to you know, music uh, ustads and all that. Dance ka tha, dance ke aspect bhi aagya. Because their dance form is very tribal and it's kind of different. Uh, so they were very keen that that should also be brought into the classroom. So, you know, all that kind of uh, way that uh, this, these kind of... Uh, uh, so I'm not going to go into the details because that will become pretty tedious because there's a technical side of it. And if anybody is interested, I'd be very happy to share any one of these booklets with you or uh, send it to Lubna Appa and she can, uh, Lubna Ji, and she can share it with you. Uh, so this is just to uh, give you a, an idea of how this whole, uh, this is a, the Ustads. The Ustads were taken in front of the teachers and they were the ones who would be speaking about uh, the heritage, uh, you know, about their craft, about their knowledge. So they just unfolded the knowledge. They didn't do the lesson. They just unfolded the knowledge. It were the teachers who built up those lessons. Then... Uh, we have this kind of a big thing that happened, you know, try to kind of put, bring some organi you know, organizational structure together, scheduled a lot of meetings with the stars. Because uh, to work in these two areas, you know, where the traditional knowledge and the traditional system of uh, the pedagogy is very different from the contemporary. So you don't want, uh, you know, there was this thing always, is there a way to embed it together in a way that will still work, that n neither one will suffer. So we had spent a lot of time over it and uh, developed thematic projects and developed an assessment system uh, for uh, classrooms and all that. I don't know whether this happens in Bangladesh, but in the research part of this project, we found out that although some of the elite schools were teaching all these, you know, were teaching dance and music and this, that and the other, but they were actually ungraded subjects. 
So the seriousness of the subject it was never established in the mind of the student. And uh, the stars raised this. Now, this was not something that was known to people generally. And it became obvious at that time that uh, this is like a marginalized kind of a step uh, sisterly treatment to, uh, to art and culture. Uh, then we had uh, this uh, thing of building partnership with schools. We had the school teachers, the principals, the curriculum developers, and all the kind of category of people who were there with us. Because obviously without that, it doesn't work. We are just outsiders and we are just technical people to a certain extent on the ICH. But this whole game of connecting it has to be done by professionals dealing with it. Then this is uh, the uh, manual that uh, that uh, uh, you know was developed, and this is uh, the one on the living traditions of Pakhtun folklore. Uh, so they were all very. Uh, we tried to make it into attractive booklets because uh, I think it's also important in how you present it because you're trying to make a way for the, this whole cultural kind of a teaching to be embedded. So we um, really researched, we had a lot of people researching it, writing on it, looking at, uh, you know, the presentation of it. Uh, these were uh, all, uh, there were a number of these booklets that were made and all the, uh, you know, they were also given in uh, CDs to all the respective schools and all that. And each one of these book, uh, the manuals as we call them, or the booklets had a, a whole system of color coding and it was, uh, you know, how to use the manual. Each manual, they were given this kind of an instruction. Although there was an introduction booklet also, which was prepared. And the uh, introduction booklet basically argued the various ways of, uh, you know, integrating uh, education in, this, in the school system. And then uh, there were student activities that were put in. There's a glossary of terms, there's vocabulary, there's activities and all that. So it's like a comprehensive little book. And one of the things that we had done out here, which became, uh, this was the first, and it's, uh, since then we've done several. We are at the moment also doing one for a certain kind of districts again in the KP. And uh, this last booklet is a very important one because it is where we are also knitting together with the idea of the project-based learning, which is popular with the uh, schools in the contemporary system. So, and, but here we draw them back into their own home, their community, and go back to recapture, uh, to uh, uh, capturing the oral history which exists within their communities, whether it's in the form of proverbs or of songs or of stories or whatever. And then uh, the second part is also something which also teaches the kind of a behavior or the mannerism which existed in our societies where you respect, uh, you know, respect the community and respect your elders and all that. So you learn from them as well. So that sense of alienation that the mother is uneducated and the child goes into school and go gets into a uniform and starts speaking English, that should be lessened through these kind of interventions. And so we have these uh, thing which says, okay, my elders, my identity. And then we say learning from the tradition bearers and elders. So they are going back and they're not looking at uh, the, the ICH bearers as people who are old fashioned. Then we have, uh, we go on, it's a cellular way that this whole thing has been organized. And the third ring of it is basically, uh, you know, our town, our context. And this is where we have developed the whole way of taking children out into various sites and all that and what they should do and, you know, how to prepare and all that kind of a thing. And then we have uh, had a big target of reviving the cultural festivals because of our, uh, you know, in Pakistan, because of this uh, situation which had arisen out here, the security and, you know, the Talibanization and all that, we'd lost a lot. We'd really lost seriously a lot. So we wanted uh, these milas to be revived. So we had a whole book on that and we wanted the schools to participate in that kind of a thing. So, uh, you know, the critical based thinking, as we all know, is honing the critical thinking and the lifelong skills of people, uh, of the children. And uh, the safeguarding ICH is basically targeting the strengthening of identity, the pride in heritage and understanding of value, meaning and knowledge that is embedded within our ICH. So through these kind of projects, we 
felt that this was going to be, uh, you know, this was our kind of a thing. And it did work well. It is not our kind of a thing. Our, by our, I mean all this, a lot of people who were involved in uh, developing this. So my second example is now from the informal kind of a sector and the informal system of uh, learning and how do we kind of organize that? Because there's a lot of ICH, which is, you know, this is always a game between the safeguarding of ICH and how do you do that? And as I said earlier, that the transmission to the, uh, you know, uh, to the next generation is critical for its survival, right? We all understand that. So this is something that we did uh, in the villages of uh, South Punjab. Uh, which is a part of Pakistan. And we have got 150 centers out there in each one of these. This is just a little kind of a, a conceptual plan of how it works, the model of it. But what I wanted to point out, okay, when you move away from the school teaching and uh, dealing with the children, and you're going into the informal uh, learning spaces which, which exist in communities, and you're trying to work within that and see how you can take it further, there are other factors which will come in. We started with this idea of uplifting the village economy through the uh, through culture and arts. This was basically through the intangible culture. We will be trying to uplift, uplift the village economies and empower women. Basically, we were much more conscious of women. Uh, you know, the TARP has a large number of women and we are women activists. So we were always anxious to do something for our sisters sitting in villages because, you know, they don't lead very interesting lives. So that was the, the issue. And we have to bring in a lot of things out here because it's not only the capturing of the training and the skill and the knowledge which is within the craft sector, but it's also how to make it into a way that it will become, people would learn. They would learn how to, uh, you know, uh, design themselves. They would not be dependent. It would not become a stale thing. They will revisit the meaning of things and all that. So we would, uh, we had our art students uh, and our designers who were working with these village, uh, you know, in the villages in a kind of a collaborative arrangement between the designer and the artisan. And then we also had the female sales agent, because if you cannot market your stuff, where will it go? You know, so we had to kind of think of the whole thing and think of the, uh, you know, the uh, financing of all this kind of a thing. How would people have access to funds and stuff like that? So the education part of it goes into a different way. But this is also critical because these opportunities will also come. And these are the opportunities that you get through the intangible cultural heritage. So this is basically the whole system of how it worked that you had these uh, home based centers. They were made in there. We spent absolutely no money because they were basically uh, convert, uh, you know, rooms which were offered by community members and usually the ustad, the master craft person, and usually a person that everybody said is the, was the most knowledgeable. So she would offer a room and the whole center would be put up like that. And then uh, we try to put all a few of these uh, centers together to make a kind of a network. Now, whatever happened there, the good, uh, you know, there are over 11,000 craftspeople that we touched over six or seven of the districts in that area. And it was pretty vibrant. It was pretty good. It was interesting. And then they didn't need, uh, you know, they went, uh, it was one of those sustainable kind of projects that happened because people managed to take over themselves and they knew exactly what they wanted then. So it's a success kind of a story in, in some ways. This is just a way to show how the designer and the, uh, you know, the artisans are working together to build up the knowledge and to, uh, you know, the transmittal of the ability to design and manage, uh, you know, new products every season or ever so often that they want to. So it's a continuously innovating, uh, innovation is happening in this kind of a system that we set up. So these are some of the places out there where you can see you know, some of the craftspeople in those villages. And uh, we would also obviously take some of the contemporary art forms because, uh, uh, you know, there were very good weavers in some village, but they didn't know Ikkat. So one of our designers, uh, he decided to go and teach them Ikkat. So that was all that going on. Now, incidentally, for the university, these are our field schools now, right? So this is again the revitalization of the the uh, you know uh, the handloom industry, which had completely died down, and uh, 
So we have uh, one or two star kind of a things that happened there. One, of course, is the Chundri, the Tai and Dai village that came up. There was one family, there's now about 2,000 people who work in that trade. And this is the handloom. And again, a whole lot of educational kind of an aspect. The reason I keep stressing on the education is not because it's not only the uh, skills. You know, the usual kind of a practice is to just do skills. But our sort of uh, uh, thrust was to try and go deeper into this value and the meaning of it. Value not only as a commodity, but value as a kind of an identity and giving them as kind of a sense of pride and all. So these are again some images that uh, we've done lots of these projects we've done it we were doing it over 12 years and now the, we've also changed the uh, and it was very experimental anything that didn't work we kind of rethought it and then we went back and tried to learn more and now we've also now brought it into another forum uh, which is to try and build up a lot of uh, designer entrepreneurs who are working in collaboration with, uh, you know, with our uh, artisans. So these are two master craftsmen out there. Uh, I said, this is kind of like an end project because, uh, you know, in the ultimate, uh, you know, like I said earlier, that it has to go through the whole value chain. It has to try and become like a livelihood project. That is also a learning that is also uh, you know, try, uh, working with the ICH and uh, the pedagogy from the inspiration. Where do you get the inspiration from? Uh, you know, you know many, I know many architects who look at uh, Dubai architecture in magazines and they try to copy that. I'm sure it happens in uh, Bangladesh as well and it's happening in India and many parts of the world. So here we were focusing on this, that you look around you and see where the inspiration can come for you. And these are areas which are extremely rich in the traditional kind of a build form. And this knowledge exists. This is the associated ICH in that, uh, in that region. And this Neel, which is blue, you know, and uh, it's a local word for blue. And a cut means the blue collective. So this is something that they did, uh, you know, as part of this uh, work that we were doing. And likewise, because there's so much there for inspiration. There are trees, if nothing else. Uh, this is something that is so beautiful. And it existed on the walls of the, you know, Havelis and the mosques and all that. And these are uh, traditional uh, kind of uh, art form, uh, the Nakashi, we call it. And I am uh, very sure that this is also there in Bangladesh, because this is where our, uh, our traditions come from. Uh, I just wanted this out so that I could show you this image of the mango, right? <laughs> now, you know, the way that they do it out there. Now, this is where the traditional person was working, you know, their ancestors. They were not copying from the Mughals or copying from this, that, and the other. Uh, the Mughals were as much invaders, by the way, as anybody else, uh, because that has uh, been a kind of a tragedy for what Pakistan's region is. But... Uh, I just look at that mango tree. You know, that mango tree has been done by people who've been looking around and seeing those mangoes growing on their trees and they put them on the walls of their mosques, you know? So that inspiration is now transferred into the new generation and uh, it continues. Then I will show you the case study three and I have one or two more, so I'm going to go quickly through it. This is also an important kind of an aspect because this is where the IEAC, which is our university and TAP really came together because we had these World Heritage Center guys from UNESCO who were all you know, in Pakistan off and on. And they would come and visit us and we would be talking about you know, the how to get communities involved in the safeguarding of the built heritage. Because the World Heritage Sites, uh, you, know, uh, the, you know, the Convention 72, as it's called, which is for the tangible cultural heritage, uh, that kind of when, was, uh, when people were working, uh, you know, with that in isolation, they kind of realized that it wasn't really getting them very far because the people were not involved and the safeguarding of it was not really very effective. Because the moment you finished working, and I worked at the Lahore Fort, I did the conservation and management plan for it. So uh, you, were, you know, the moment we walked out, there goes everything. You know, people were, didn't care anymore. 
So this realization came basically from the World Heritage Center. And I think with pressures from people who were working in the field and all that. And they started saying to you that, uh, you know, the communities have to be involved. And this is now the new direction out in the tangible heritage. So you start looking also for the intangible heritage, which is always associated with the tangible. So it's a kind of a holistic way that you look at heritage. And uh, so we uh, they were asked to kind of do some, uh, you know, they gave us their goals. One of their big, biggest thing was this, that community involvement in sustainable development at World Heritage Sites and capacity building for traditional building crafts. In three districts, they asked us to do that. Now, we came up with our kind of uh, uh, things that were important to us. You know, you always get work from here and there, but, uh, you know, uh, we always have to look for what uh, we think is uh, uh, you know, important for us also, and find that within the work that we do. I am stuck with this. Okay, so we were we wanted to develop a, a pedagogy which was integrating the contemporary system with the traditional, and we worked and worked and worked with that. And I'll show you what all we did. Uh, and uh, we were wanting to also develop. Uh, the safeguarding plan for traditional knowledge. So there were two aspects which we were kind of trying to work with. And we said, okay, we're doing the education part of it. So education will not only mean the transfer of skills, but we're talking of meaning, value, and all that. And we're talking of all those things that I said earlier. Uh, so then we say that, okay, this is just images of that, the pedagogy and how it was developed. And these are all tradition bearers who are working within the university now and our students. And we work through something that we've set up there, which is called the Center for Creative Partnership, where the contemporary knowledge and the traditional knowledge is uh, you know, coming together. And this is where the nexus and the pedagogies are developed. So this is just some images from this uh, exercise, the tradition bearers who were kind of uh, like, uh, given much space and importance so that, uh, you know, they would be, um, uh, you know, uh, there for, uh, this, uh, these are manuals, uh, this was the uh, manual of pedagogy which, uh, and practice manuals which we brought out based on this kind of a work, which is part of now our, uh, you know, repertoire of uh, at the higher education level. It is not necessarily restricted to that, but it started at the higher education. And for us, you know, sort of every student has to work with a traditional practitioner in whatever field they're working in. They have to have a traditional practice uh, component in their training, uh, you know, in their education. <coughs> this is the exhibition that was put up at the end. And that uh, was called Interweaving the Classical Arts in the Modern. Now, one of the things that, uh, you know, this, uh, I would just like to point out that, you know, we talk of all of these things as, uh, as crafts and this and that, just because it's not that crafts are secondary, but also, because, uh, you know, it's uh, a lot to do with the way that uh, the West looks at art and craft. Craft was always at the uh, secondary level. So we think, and we are sure of it, that some of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, art form, the, uh, some of these crafts are actually our classical art forms. So we are trying to revive that, like we're trying to revive the classical uh, text within our classical, for, you know, folklore and um, classic, uh, you, know, you know, classic kind of stories and all that. So that distinguish, you have to kind of start distinguishing between that to really give it its proper place and status. So these are just uh, some more images of the hall and the exhibition that is put up. A lot of work was done for it. And, uh, you know, we were inviting all the architects and all the users out here because after all, we need to have an audience. We need to have people who will appreciate and also purchase and hire them for, the, for this job. These are now a, a, a group of uh, the tradition bearers and the... Uh, uh, you know, the, the bearded man is a very good Ajrak kind of, a, you know, uh, person. He's a traditional practitioner, Ustadi of Ajrak. 
And these are all sitting together and trying to kind of figure out how it is, uh, you know, how to develop the pedagogy. There are teachers sitting out there who are actually just focusing on that. Now, in the whole idea of collaboration, we then look at this thing that, uh, you know, we have made a very big and important collaboration with one of our very, very important kind of, uh, it's called the Wall City of Law and Authority which basically looks after the heritage of Lahore. As of yesterday, they've also been given the mandate to look after all of Punjab heritage. And we have a collaboration with them and we've set up a heritage center in which we offer some courses and we're, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, their kind of place and uh, our kind of uh, locations of uh, what we talked about. They act as field schools for the students and all that. And uh, this is also a, a, an effort to try and safeguard our ICH and of course our built heritage as well. Now the last bit, because I put it uh, you know, separately from here, was the whole idea of how to use museums because we've also done a lot of work, uh, I mean, it's a significant work. We're still probing, we're still learning. It's very difficult to say that you've got it. I don't think you ever somehow get it because there's always something that you've missed out and you're trying to kind of again battle with that. And this is a museum. And you know, when you have these small museums and not in the main cities, in the main cities, they have a different kind of a perspective, but in small cities and in small uh, you know, towns, they set up these museums, but there's no value of it. People don't even know how to use it or what to do with it. So we've been trying to work with these small kind of museums and see how schools can be connected to it. And not just this, that you take them for a field visit or something like that but to do it in a more integ integrated kind of a way. So uh, we isolated the kind of issues that uh, we had. And the main issue basically was this, that the museums are not looked as, a, as education spaces for children. So we go back to where we started, you know, where the integration of uh, ICH within the schools, uh, in the school system. And at the end you're saying, okay, what is outside that? What is outside the school? other than the community ICH, is there any kind of places which have been built where objects lie and they lie in isolation without any great understanding? Are those objects, any uh, objects within that, a part of the community's ICH? Do they still practice that? Do they, st do they still exist out there? So uh, we set up these kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, objectives out here and the kind of outputs that we looked at. Again, what was important for us that whatever the end product was going to be, it has to be attractive. It has to be done properly. We have a lot of animations that we produce on stories and stuff like that, because we're trying to engage the children. Uh, you know, uh, in most of our books, because of trying to keep it uh, at a low cost, you know, end up by being not attractive for children. So we have to look at the modern uh, kind of uh, technologies available to us. So therefore we have animations. We've done a bit of game uh, around heritage uh, and we try to make attractive books for them, if nothing else. And then we also obviously have to take uh, into account the staff which is there, which are going to deal with children. So we have to also, we did a lot of training of the staff and trying to, you know, it's amazing that sometimes in these small uh, museums, they have these amazing artifacts and they don't even know anything about it. You know, they don't know the history and all that. I don't fault them because, you know, obviously the, the whole system is failing. So these are uh, like the traditional craftsmen who were brought into the picture and they are there, there's the potter because there's a whole gallery of pottery out there and that pottery, uh, you know, uh, knowledge still exists, the techniques are the same and all that. So these are the, uh, they, they, we held some workshops and now that's become the uh, part of the whole kind of a uh, museum system. I don't know whether they still continue, but I think they are. And, uh, uh, and in that, uh, we also did one with the traditional games because traditional games is again, something which gives you a lot, a big opening because all these games are designed either to teach you language or to teach you math or uh, mm -hmm. to teach you some aspect of life, right? And if you get uh, some brilliant teachers with you, I mean, I give full credit to the teachers we had with us. There was this fantastic math teacher 
and he had the whole class, you know, he had 80 students. I was freaking out at the idea that you have 80 little kids around you and you're trying to teach math. And he did this hopscotch on the, on the floor and then he'd put some other games there and he taught like math lessons through those traditional games. So that's where the layers of, in, uh, of knowledge can be brought into the uh, arena of the classroom. And the class was so excited, so excited. I still remember another time where, you know, they do these tapas, which I mentioned, those couplets. So, you know, uh, because it's an informal and a traditional kind of a thing and, and an intangible cultural heritage, it never entered the classroom. So I said, I want to hear some tapas from these kids. And there were children who were really jumping around. I couldn't understand a word because their language is different from my language. But uh, there was so much excitement and the whole class was like so vibrant. So I think that uh, uh, for, uh, there's, there's a lot there, there out there that you can gain through the ICH uh, and, uh, and education. And out here, I've just kind of like at the last point that I'll make is this, that uh, the electronic applications that we developed for the museum so that children could go around and uh, you know, play and mm -hmm. interact with some of these artifacts. That also is important. You have to use the modern technology. These are the books that came out at the end of it. Uh, I think they're also online, so you could see it there. If not, I'm here to share it with Luknaji. And uh, these are some just images to show the capacity building work. And now this is a very conservative part of the country. And uh, I think one of the successes is also this, how excitement of working with the intangible cultural heritage and bring people together, even to the extent that they might, uh, you know, allow the girls and the boys to be working in the same room. So this is just images of the classroom, of the museum. And there were lots of exercises that were set around our thematic project, you know, that community-based learning that I had uh, mentioned earlier. And then again, that uh, going back to the idea of cooperation and alliances, that, uh, you know, uh, that basically the idea is that people working in the same sector should try to get together. And it is a, our key uh, interventions are developing a people-centered approach and remaining, you know, hopefully humble. Because frankly, you know, when you get out there into the field of culture in this kind of uh, with the communities, you realize how little you know. That's one thing. And then collaborate with communities and in between communities and groups and traditional bearers and all that. So that is the presentation. I hope it made some sense. Thank you so very much. This is absolutely awesome work that you have done. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. My pleasure. I hope you it made some sense to you and I. Absolutely. We are, I am in awe of all the amount of work that you have done. Is this for the last 10, 15 years, is it? Uh, 2006 onwards. Yeah, 15 years almost. Yeah. But this is, uh, we, you know, we were lucky in a sense. We had a chance. Uh, uh, we were given lots of work to do. We were always working ourselves. Uh, you know, it's a struggle in, in a way, as you would know, uh, Lubnaji, that uh, all of this also costs money to do. You know, how the hell to go around only. You know, it's, so it's a kind of an expensive thing. So we had a very... So, uh, uh, I just have a question. How, how, how much of this have you been able to... Uh, uh, integrate into the mainstream education? Um, off and on, not really. I wouldn't say that it's very mm -hmm. kind of integrated, still struggling with that. In fact, I have a meeting with the government of the KP in uh, UNESCO offices on, mm -hmm. uh, the, on Tuesday, just for that reason. Because, you know, it is, uh, I don't know, you know, it's, uh, it will vary from country to country. I because we have a national curriculum. They want a uniform curriculum. We are asking for a local content in a curriculum. So that, those are the difficulties. 
you know, and sure. I think that uh, although it sounds very simple, it is not that simple because there's a political dimension to it. Sure. Sure. So I like the fact that you talk about un unlocking knowledge within uh, the uh, various practices. So that uh, must have been very intense uh, sitting down with the uh, heritage holders. I, I suppose you must have sat down with them and with the contemporary teachers. Uh, how long did this whole process take? Well, this is an ongoing process. I think you get a, you know, uh, in a project, it might take you whatever, you know, uh, but throughout uh, you are exploring that. That is the key. I mean, if you don't understand it, and I think we, I'm, a, you know, come from the world of the visual arts. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's, a, it's also something that we've learned in our, uh, you know, in our architectural kind of education, because we do kind of uh, develop this kind of a skill of uh, trying to understand uh, the layers of knowledge and this, that, and the other. Yes. And developing a, developing a pedagogy which integrates the contemporary and the traditional, it's a, such a wonderful way of uh, yeah. uh, it's a safeguarding. Yeah. It is uh, something that uh, I think we are, uh, we've got kind of uh, some uh, headway out there, but the way that, uh, you know, uh, it's still not practiced uh, throughout. You know, it's restricted mm -hmm. to some universities. Some people have to obviously be the pioneers in this kind of work. But the school side is promising. Very good. We would love to send uh, students from Bangladesh to your uh, uh, university. More than happy to receive them, uh, Lubnaji. This is, would be is, a it, real, is this uh, a pleasure. master's program, isn't it? We have master's program and we also have and, uh, short programs. We are now developing online programs that we have started offering. We have got oh, two or three. Yeah, I think the online programs we should, uh, you know, I mean, if you have some online programs there, we should avail that and, you know, let's get to know each other. Surely, and uh, uh, it would be wonderful if our students could get together. Yeah, uh, I've been exactly. thinking of this uh, students of uh, cultural heritage from all over South Asia if we can have a forum where they can discuss all this without us interfering. And I'm also fascinated with the folklore that you have a department of folklore and uh, what you're doing there and all. You should do so, you know, just a program on that so that we find Surely. out a little more about what, uh, you know, what is happening. We have uh, uh, Mr. Baki Billa here with us. Who's the head of the folklore? Uh, no, his, his internet is very poor. Mm. Stays. Anyway, the Bangladesh has such a rich heritage of folk performances. And uh, the, what you spoke about unlocking uh, the knowledge within that, that, that should give our participants some idea. Uh, যে এক একটা এক একটা চর্চার মধ্যে যে কত রকম জ্ঞান আছে সেটাকে আমাদেরকে সেটার বিশ্লেষণ করে সেটার ভিতর থেকে অঙ্ক সেটার ভিতর থেকে গল্প বলা সেটার ভিতর থেকে কবিতা বার করা এটা খুবই গুরুত্বপূর্ণ আই এম ওয়ান্ডারিং ইফ এনি ইফ এনি অফ आवर পার্টিসিপেন্টস হ্যাভ এনি কোশ্চেন কারো কি কোনো প্রশ্ন আছে Moli, Upuma. Hmm. Ma'am, uh, I have a question, uh, if you permit me. Yes, of course. We okay. want you uh, to question. Shukanto is from the Manipuri community, which is an indigenous committee. Walter Shukanto. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, ma'am, for your speech. And we have learned many things, um, actually not uh, from uh, by our outer eyes, but also with our inner house and by our mind. So uh, I am an ethnomusicology research student. So uh, I have uh, a question according to my uh, particular area. So uh, this question would be a little bit bigger. Um, I'm trying to elaborate this. 
So in South Asian perspective, the Guru Parampara system can be termed as the traditional education system in ISIS education, uh, in the music or dance or anything else. So uh, in present times, technology has been included in this Guru Parampara system, uh, such as uh, I also sent my audio clips of my raga to my guru. So yeah. uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, Sajida Ji and all are working with the Ustad is part of the Guru Parampara, Guru Shisha Parampara, isn't it? Yeah, it is very much there. But, you know, I don't know, you know, a lot of the Gurus, or we call them Ustads here. You know, you call them Gurus, yes. we call them Ustad. And that domestic we system, call them uh, I also call them that. So that uh, system, of course, uh, will, uh, is still prevalent in the intangible cultural heritage, particularly in the arts, it's very prevalent. But in some areas of the arts, it's moved into a larger platform. As you know, you know, fine, uh, the painting is not taught in that system anymore. So the question here is this, is it possible to not lose the traditional system and to have it integrated that both can coexist that's the whole issue. Mm -hmm. So if we say that the gurus, uh, you know, uh, they are, they have knowledge, but they keep their knowledge here close to them, and they perhaps do not, uh, uh, you know, have not had the opportunity to know what is the contemporary knowledge like. So we cannot mm -hmm. kind of exist in these kind of parallel threads, which cannot meet ever. Right? So this is uh, the... Can you the, give an uh, example uh, how, of how uh, you integrate it? Uh, so we, uh, the example that uh, we have is, uh, you know, like uh, when we work in our, uh, let me give it to you from the visual arts area, okay? Now in the uh, traditional system, they would sit with the Ustad and he would teach them and there's a whole system of how that kind of works. Now, if you study that system, so you find out that there are certain things which are actually common. Because, you know, the Ustad, I don't know whether it happens there, but it happens here. The Ustad of uh, dance, who was teaching my daughter, did not take her as his student till she could prove that she was, the she was worthy of being the student. Right? So it was not like anybody can mm -hmm. walk in and say, okay, okay, I'm your student. He has to accept her as a student by claiming that she, ha that she has the talent in that particular field. So that's the commonality between that. Then we have the, uh, you know, the way that the assessment takes place. That uh, in our kind of part here in Pakistan, before the person can go into a public performance, the student, and it will take years, you know, years and years and years. So the Ustad will first call his friends and he will ask them to demonstrate, the student to demonstrate, you know, do some work. And if the Ustads approve that, then they will get into the system of, uh, you know, uh, of, they will get the approval and they can go ahead and dance or be on their own type thing. So we basically start analyzing the system which exists in both areas, evaluation, assessment, acceptance, and you try to look for the commonalities within it. So those become the kind of an anchor that you are working with. We have full-time Ustads who are called professors of practice who are within the university. So they are there all day with us, with uh, the contemporary faculty. And uh, they interact and they work together on various things. But the commonalities have been first, uh, you know, put together as areas that will bring them, you know, closer. And you are not only looking at this, uh, uh, you know, because the image of the Ustad is that he will be in his uh, batik, you know, and he will have one student one by one, you know, like one-to-one -one kind of a teacher will go on and, you know, there's no system to it. 
But you have to un, uh, you know, uh, unlock first also the system that under which they are operating. So when we started doing that, you see the kind of a parallel things that happen. Then they have a system in which they say the repetition, right? Now we also have in our art practices, even in the contemporary art practice, a system in which there is that repetition. In fact, that's a common thing between the classical, uh, for teaching of classical arts in our region, right? That you have to practice something again and again and again. That's the kind of a repetition through which you learn. They do that also in art, for example, miniature painting. The pedagogy for miniature painting is also like this, that they start, uh, you know, going back to the, uh, you know, to the uh, to an, a, a classical drawing or something, a, uh, and a traditional piece of work, and then they start copying that, and that's how mm -hmm. they learn, right? So those kind of a, there, there is a, you know some parallel which you can find in that also, but then you can also raise the question, and this is the burning question within the arts: Is it necessary to do it this way? Now, I know that as dancers, you will say, of course, you can't do a thing unless you learn the basics. You know, you have to learn the bandishes. In music, also, that exists. In art, it's a little more uh, fluid. So people are kind of debating it heavily out there. So these are the kind of uh, ways that we try to kind of work within, uh, with trying to bring these two uh, systems together. Fantastic. I, I am very much tempted to request you to share all your publications with us, if that is possible. We will, of course, exactly. uh, look for it online. And if we uh, thank you so much. Uh, you give me your address, I'll send it to you then. Thank you so much. And I, my, our students will also benefit from this. And uh, thank you again so very, very much. I would again like our participants to uh, if they have any questions to speak to Sajidaji. Uh, we have a huge problem with English, Sajidaji. So oh, I'm sorry. So I must have are, made no sense. Uh, no, no, no. They are absorbing this all. They understand. But, you know, this. Uh, they, I feel that they are very shy uh, speaking up. Uh, as soon as we are discussing this tomorrow, they will have 101 questions. So, what is the Bangladeshi person? What is the Bangladeshi person? What is the Bangladeshi person? Your uh, presentation was so very uh, clearly stated. I, I'm, I'm sure they will all benefit. This, this goes to show your years of experience uh, of communicating all of this uh, to students of ICH. You're being kind. Uh, we are all- Not at all, not at all. I'm uh, totally astounded by the amount of work that you have already done. And I'm sure you're continuing with it. Karo kichu bola na thakle anto to kyo ekjon dhunnobad da ona ke. Ma'am, I just I have a question. I just want to say that thank you so much for this amazing session. I mean, it was really uh, clearly stated the whole thing. I don't have any question. I just want to say that this whole thing is really an eye opener, opening thing for us. That how we should actually in our uh, for Bangladesh the ICH. Um, the term ICH is not, we are not very familiar with the concept of Bangladesh, but uh, this uh, presentation has showed us that how uh, among the community or among the uh, general people, we can uh, introduce this context specific knowledge and safeguard the community and ICH elements. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with Modi. I think this, this also has shown us a path uh, uh, that we could very easily try and follow because ICH is very new here. Uh, Lubnaji, it's actually new everywhere. You know, I think that we have to accept that because you see, it is also an empowering kind of a feel. 
Right. Because you should look I at feel, it. I feel that it is also a sort of, uh, a, 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 indirectly, it's also a human rights uh, convention. Exactly. It, in, it empowers not, the community. It empowers the community. Therefore, you know, it is not, although they signed up on it because of the identity side to it. But when you start mm -hmm. practicing it, it basically means you're empowering the community to take charge of their culture, you know? Absolutely. And Absolutely. Take charge of their lives. So what happens? I don't think it goes down well in, uh, <laughs> well in, I, you know, in many parts of the world. So that is the issue. It's a political issue also. So it also depends on uh, cultural activists and NGOs to yeah. build an awareness about the convention within communities. And I think while, uh, you know, when you start working on it and you start looking at the, uh, you know, the particularly, you know, where you're working with de in the development sector, you also look at the economics of it and how, where, how people can be beneficiaries sure. yeah. and all that. I think that will uh, start becoming, uh, you know, that will start making the change. We worked 10, 15 years, but you know, like you asked me this question, is it mainstreamed? We've been making an effort to mainstream it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, because there is an inherent issue involved out here. They're not ready to accept mm -hmm. the local content and we're talking of, you know, the intangible cultural heritage. Sure. Yeah. Em empowering the communities goes against what the state wants. Exactly. So uh, I have been thinking of this uh, as I'm thinking aloud with you. Uh, how can we connect our students uh, with your students? You know, to have younger people uh, discussing ICH and the way ahead. Uh, Think of some idea on, on, uh, which will uh, make them, uh, you know, and we can just uh, put, a, put them through on the uh, online. Surely. Yeah, you know, let's you get, get uh, think of a way to kind of have a have a dialogue, like a dialogue Absolutely. on something, you know, whichever is a, an important kind of a, a area for them to reflect on. I would re really like to connect young people from all over South Asia working with ICH mm. uh, so that they, yeah. you know, this, this can be an integrated whole. And I, I, and I really agree with you that it uh, also helps uh, promote peacekeeping. Mm. What we learned about uh, the marvelous art, uh, art uh, and culture heritage of uh, Pakistan is something that our young people have been very distanced from politically, which mm. is very, very unfortunate. Well, that's a sad part of it, actually, because, uh, you know, there's a commonality of, uh, I mean, uh, you know, there's so much in common. Look at our uh, music traditions. Isn't Absolutely. it uh, something, uh, Shukanta? Shukanto. Isn't it something that, uh, Shukanta? Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> there's so much uh, in common that we have there, and yet we uh, know so little about each other. So I think wow. that should change. You know, we, we should be talking. Yes, ma'am, sure. I, you know, if I get an opportunity, Lubna, to, uh, uh, you know, to see if how we can include Bangladesh in that, uh, if I have a chance, we're just kind of working at it, on that uh, culture for peace issue. Yeah, we would love to be part of it. Need to, uh, we need to do that. Yeah. Especially given our very gloomy past. Yeah, uh, exactly. we have to overcome that, and we have to build mm. up a solidarity, solidarity for peace. Uh, I, I am very much for it. I am very much a South Asian at heart. Mm, exactly. So, uh, so we, we will think of something, uh, uh, some sort of a platform where we can get our students together to discuss ICAs, to discuss values, to discuss culture, to discuss peace building. Thank you so uh, much. I, you don't know how grateful we are to you. Not at all. Please don't say that you embarrassed me. It's my. Only matro COVID nineteen theki uthe sen. To tomader kya karu ke kichu bola thakhe ekte akoni bado. 
ফরগেট <laughs> grateful time that we cannot forget this and we are <laughs> uh, we we want to see you again uh, among us and to discuss about this ICH and uh, we want to learn many things from your experience again and again and also with your students well thank you so much as we have another thing in common covid <laughs> <laughs> covid yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we we will get back to to you with more proposals and hope we can see you again thank you thank you thank you so much again thank you so much uh, this, so this whole uh, whole the session was live streamed on youtube and it is available for everyone uh, you can watch it again on youtube i'm sure it will be worth watching several times over and over again thank you to the students and thank you sadhu Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you ji and very lovely to have you group there see you again see you again i'm now trying to get a <laughs> oh, this technology is too much where is the switch off button tumra shobai ektu du minute thako ni chole jabar por ji khala acha so they will be writing about your presentation and i'll send send you your their responses okay that will be lovely yeah mm. well i will have to go off this some other way but uh, thank you <laughs> yes yes, uh, yes. now i know so what to do okay, okay. thank you okay uh, thank you আমি লাইভ স্ট্রিমিংটা বন্ধ করে দিই একটু এক সেকেন্ড 